Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our showcase. So this is our Neurodiversity in Tech, or ND Tech, uh, summer showcase. My name is Pamela Cosman, and I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering here, and the director of, of this program at UCSD. So this program is an internship that is eight weeks long and only half time, so four hours a day. It's a paid internship. We have 16 interns here at UC San Diego, and then there's, in our sister program at Northeastern University, there's another similar group. Uh, that program is run by Professor Leanne Chukoski, who started the program originally here at UCSD. This is a team-based internship, and it focuses on creation of educational video games. So first I want to set the context of why are we doing this and what exactly are we doing? Okay, so neurodiversity uh, encompasses autism spectrum, ADHD, learning differences like dyslexia, Tourette syndrome, and other kinds of neurocognitive differences. It's a growing population, um, and in some segments it has high unemployment or high underemployment. But there is a growing movement underway um, in companies as well as academia about understanding and welcoming neurodiversity. And this has some obvious advantages from the point of view of the neurodiverse and of society at large because of more workforce participation and broadening opportunities. But there are also advantages that accrue to the companies themselves that engage in these initiatives. And these are the advantages of diverse groups coming with different perspectives, talents, and creativity. And this is something that's, uh, that I feel personally in my, my own career from the point of view of being a woman in electrical engineering. And I've seen how over the last several decades with more women coming in, it changes in some cases the actual technical nature of the work being done. And it also very much changes the culture of engineering, which is for the benefit of all. So this is something that with neurodiversity is happening as well as companies change the way that they do recruitment, the way they might do uh, workplace communications, and these changes benefit everybody. So the need as we see it is a combination of training on durable hard skills and tools for tech jobs, but also very much supporting soft skills needed for employment, so things like teamwork and communications. And we are trying to help build an ecosystem here that will involve academia and industry and the community. So you might ask as part of the why, like why video games? So apart from the fact that they are fun, um, it's also a very common area of, of interest for young adults and for the neurodiverse in particular. And there's a range of skills needed. So it's not just programmers, say, or artists, but both as well as project managers and people who do audio and so forth. Um, and also because it can almost fit in the context of a summer. Part of the context also that I'd like to share has to do with our National Science Foundation Future of Work grant. So this is a grant that has multiple pieces um, which surround the internship. So part of it is the development of tech tools that we're undertaking. There's a virtual reality mock job interview, um, and we're doing analysis of gaze behavior and body orientation during conversations. Another piece has to do with ethics and policy, and that's like led by Professor Craig Callender, who's here. Um, and so we're, we're interested in things like the ethics of these tech tools, so privacy uh, considerations. And also, um, Professor Callender has been studying the personality tests that are used for screening in, in some hiring contexts, and what effect does this have on the neurodiverse. We also have a component that is in education, um, and that's led by Professor Shauna Cohen over there. Uh, so this concerns both professional development for our interns, as well as a study of family, community, and coaching support. And then lastly, there is research on the internship model itself. So quantitative and qualitative program evaluation that we undertake each year, and modification of the internship over time. Let me introduce you to the people and the roles that are in the internship. So first of all, there are the interns who are young adults and not all of them, but mostly uh, neurodiverse. So each team has an artist, a designer, 
uh, project manager and two programmers. We also, as an experiment this year, decided to put in one shared sound designer across all three of the teams. Then we have the coaches who work with the interns on a daily basis, and we were extremely fortunate this year to have two experienced coaches, Corley and Trent, who are knowledgeable on game design, on programming, on neurodiversity, and they've done a fantastic job. We have the clients and stakeholders. So these are the people who've been asked uh, originally to specify a game concept. So that's sort of like the, the overarching um, idea that is given to the interns. So this year we had uh, Sherry and Matt who are external to UCSD and two people, Aaron and Dominique who are within UCSD. So thank you. And then there's the Ubisoft mentors. So for those of you who don't know, Ubisoft is one of the 10 largest video game companies in the world. And they have uh, generously donated the time of their employees um, to provide technical advice as well as career advice um, to our interns. So we've had four mentors for our teams, uh, Soha, Lena, David, and Jay, uh, who have different areas of technical expertise. And they also provide more general advice on things like scheduling or client relationships or what is a minimum viable product. So those are the roles that are assigned sort of to specific teams, but then we also have the faculty, the graduate student researchers, and the program evaluators who are associated with the internship as a whole. So, all of this that we're doing is only going to get you so far without the efforts and the buy-in and the initiatives that are in industry as well. And one of the companies that is at the forefront of this is Ubisoft. So I'd like to just uh, share with you on this message. Um, this is from Pierre Esquesh, who is a Neurodiversity Talent Program Director at Ubisoft. Hello everyone, my name is Pierre Esquesh and I work as Neurodiversity Talent Program Director at Ubisoft. Over the last eight weeks, we had the great opportunity to bring some Ubisoft mentors in support of the interns project you're about to discover now. Oh, sorry about that. That's fine, and we'll just play for I would here. like today, first of all, to congratulate the interns for their work and dedication on developing their projects. Developing video game is an iterative process and a real craft that requires time and passion. Getting into a dev team for the first time is an important learning milestone. So we've been very pleased to have the chance to share our own experience and knowledge with you. To develop great games, we need to call for a wide range of talent, and we need all type of talents. What we would like to share with you today is that neurodivergent talents are more than welcome to develop games. At Ubisoft, we are quite a few developers to self-identify as neurodivergent. About 18 months ago, we created an employee resource group on neurodiversity. It is growing every day, and already gather 350 colleagues across 20 different countries. And all neurological conditions are represented in this group, from the spectrum of autism to ADHD or learning disorder like dyslexia. So we know about the talent and skills we can bring as neurodivergent to develop great games. And we can only encourage you to continue experimenting developing games. We also learned that to access and fully unlock our talents, we as an employer need to adapt our work environment to each and every co of our colleagues. This is why we created this year an official neurodiversity talent program at Ubisoft. Together with the employee resource group, we aim to empower current and future neurodiverse employees and give them the support they need to realize their full potential. And for the coming years, we are facing a major challenge. Find and recruit more diverse game developers. This could be you, 
and you could become our future colleagues. So a big thank you to the uh, University of California San Diego team to drive this internship program, because this is an alternative way to detect, develop and promote atypical talents. And we need more of that in the future. So I wish you all an excellent event and to all the interns, keep on going. You're doing great. Thank you. So thank you to Pierre Esquesh and the Ubisoft team for serving as mentors for our interns. The internship has a lot of elements and can't tell you everything today, um, but there are lunch and learn sessions um, where we discuss things like the importance of first impressions, building resumes and building an online presence, uh, public speaking and so forth. Uh, there's the Fabulous app, uh, which is for forming habits. So this is something that, we, that is new for 2022, um, and it's something that can help build habits both uh, personally at, at home, eating a good breakfast and getting to work on time, or build ha habits that occur in the workplace of the checklist that you might have to go through when you do a software update. The interns are learning about workplace practices and tools, uh, some of which you'll hear about today, Jira, Discord, Git, and Unity. They're having an interdisciplinary team experience. They're learning productivity skills, including time management, technical skills, and it's all part of this professional development. But that's enough about the introduction. I know what you're here for is to hear about the interns making their games. So with that, let me turn it over uh, to our wonderful coaches. So, Corley Huang is our program administrator as well as the coach for uh, two of the teams. And she's a graduate of UCSD from a year ago in the interdisciplinary program for computing and the arts. So she's an expert both on programming and on art. Corley. actually have um, team one get up on the stage right now as well. So thanks, Pam. As mentioned previous, my name is Corley, and I am the coach for two of the teams this summer. Um, and with that, ooh, this is not a good picture. Ooh, <laughs> Teddy, <laughs> jail. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our first team of the afternoon to all of you. Project Interference, which was done in collaboration with Sherry and Matt from BSCS Science Learning, as well as the guidance of Jay and Soha from Ubisoft as their mentors as well. And so without further ado, I will hand off the mic to Girish, who will introduce us. Good afternoon. We are Team Interference, and we will be presenting our project today. Before we begin, I want to let the teammates introduce themselves. Andrea. Yes, my name is Andrea. I am a current graduate student at UCSD. I am one of the programmers for the team. My name is Girish, and I'm currently a student at Palomar College and planning to transfer to a four-year university, and I'm the project manager for the team. Uh, hi, my name is Kieran. I'm a Finest City Improv graduate and an aspiring voice actor. I was a game designer and UI uh, designer for the team. Hi, my name is Natalie. I'm a current student at Mesa College and I am the artist for this team. Good morning, I am Sean. I'm going to be a freshman at Michigan State and I was one of the programmers for this team. And I'm Teddy Gigstad. I did sound design for uh, all three of the teams, and I'm currently studying percussion performance at uh, University of Denver. All right, now I will be here to introduce what the project is about. So what our client wanted was um, for a vehicle, particularly this green car, as you see here, to move around on the screen and receive communications from the transmitter off screen. The goal is to arrive at the storage bunker or the destination while maintaining an acceptable form of communication along the way. The player is responsible for controlling which frequency band is used to maintain proper communication. The purpose of this game is to teach a younger audience, say elementary and middle schoolers, to learn about radio interference and its real life applications. 
Originally, they wanted a World War II、um, kind of setting. However, we as a team decided that we wanted to have a more kid-friendly experience, a、uh, uh, kid-friendly setting. So we decided to make a set on an alien planet,、uh, a food deadly recently on an alien planet that is. So the player is a space cat that receives food orders、uh, via audio while following a preordained path. So as you can see here, there are transmission towers that are scattered across the map with that、uh, with a specific color. If the player is on the same frequency or color, then the message will be、um, distorted in some way. So the cat has to switch between a different frequency band in order to maintain a high quality word、um, throughout the entire game. If the player stays on the low quality band, then it will receive a form of static or a complete hiss, depending on the intensity of the interference, which can be indicated on the top of this device, as you see here. Once it arrives at a house,、uh, as you can see, like the purple house here,、uh, a simple quiz will pop up with four two-syllable words.、Um, the player is responsible for choosing which one of the words they hear, and then the cat will deliver the item that the player selects. Thanks, Andrea. Now we will talk about some of the process behind making the game. As project manager, like all other teams, we use a project management tool called Jira. I had to create tickets on Jira, so that you can communicate. So I can communicate with the team often. PowerPoint slides. Communicate. Yeah. I had. To, I was also、uh, cre creating PowerPoint slides for client and mentor meetings to update them on our progress. Something I had to learn was organizing text and image, so that people so can read them, easily read them. Here's an example of our weekly sprint. When the teammates start the ticket, they'd move it to the in progress column, so we know who did what.、Mm -hmm. Once a ticket is completed, it goes to the quality assurance, and After that, it goes to the done. All right. So for the main assets、um, of the game, I used an、uh, on-browser site called PixelArt.com for all the pixel art assets that are within the game. And then for concept art or UI cats, like or just、um, or the cutscenes, I used an iOS application named Procreate. And here are the cat sprites.、Um, uh, he went through a little bit of a design change. Originally, he had a helmet, but we decided to go for the off helmet look, and、um, this is what we went with for the final design. And then these are the house assets. I tried to give it like a cute,、um, friendly look, a little surrealist and alien, since it's on an alien planet. And then we have the radio towers. One has lights, and the other doesn't. And here are the backgrounds, still going for that surrealist alien-esque look.、Um, try to make it look、um, very like pastel, very saturated colors. And here are the cutscenes. So basically, these are just little visual indicators to show the kind of main overarching story we have going on of the cat delivering food. So in the first cutscene,、um, an alien is ordering food from from the cat, and in the second cutscene, the cat received the order. Um, via his little antenna, and is going to deliver the food. Hello,、uh, I am the designer for、um, our game, and I used a program called Figma, which I had never worked with before.、Um, so what I ended up doing in Figma is、uh, Figma was making the main screen menus, call to action buttons,、uh, player tools, and、um, Kind of almost a lot of the things that you press or see.、Uh, like I just mentioned, I had never really used Figma before. I I'm new to the scene of design, and when thinking about what to create for the game, I thought of like what draws people in these days, and、uh, it hit me with something like cute. And what goes with cuteness for me is animals. And then that's how we came up with the space cat.、Uh, 
Um, thinking of the name, I'm a pretty punny person, and so we got together, tossed out some stuff, and that's uh, how Interference was born. <clears throat> um, each day, we checked in with each other, and we were really good with communicating. And even though I uh, had the role of the game designer, everything that we had talked about, I took into consideration. And without them, we wouldn't have the final product. So I am very proud to be on uh, team number one. They worked really hard. So uh, for the soundtrack, I did one that uh, is currently um, in the main menu, and then Sean also did one that he'll talk about after me that uh, is for the um, actual levels. So um, for mine, I started in uh, a program, or an in-browser tool, I should say, I guess, uh, uh, called uh, Jumbox that basically just allows you to loop a bunch of different sounds. Um, and once I found uh, an electronic instrument that uh, sort of evoked Space Cat, I, um, I started building other loops on top of that until I had a good idea of what I wanted it to sound like. Then I, um, I had them sort of uh, build on each other, which I, I recorded in Audacity and imported to Soundtrap. Uh, I also recorded myself um, uh, playing drum set for part of it, uh, and, and sort of once it uh, it peaks around the middle or towards the end ish, um, it goes back to the the f instruments at the very beginning for a little bit, and then it cuts out to just uh, me playing uh, solo marimba, and uh, that's uh, basically how it's designed. I guess. For my soundtrack and Muse score. Uh, I combined a simple bass synthesizer loop with a nice little mellow drum set to to kind of encapsulate again the feeling of space. Uh, it kind of have a, has a very subtle groove uh, with the bass synthesizer really kind of putting in that space feeling. Uh, the last thing here is that the voices, all voices, were done by Kieran. So yes. Uh we developed this game under uh, the Unity engine. Basically, the uh, player traverses through a, pass, uh, a path and then identifies these keywords on the way. There are three levels. Um, each level increases the number of objectives or buildings over time. Um, we also have a map feature that uh, displays the levels, buildings, or obstacles that you need to go through. Um, and there are cutscenes that appear in between each level in the case. Um, the main thing is the win condition in which you need to correctly deliver 80% of the orders um, that the level has. Uh, we will uh, display more through this game demo that we have for you. Now, sadly, this goes really fast, especially since it's an auto scroller, but it just goes insanely fast. So I'll only be able to talk about a few of the things here. So first things first is the main game mechanic. Mustard. We start with words that are repeated to you. They are the deliveries that you have to make. And at houses, you get a choice of a certain amount of words, and you can get the delivery in. Uh, if you take too long to deliver it, uh, you'll be out of time, and it'll just fail immediately. If you choose the wrong word, it does fail immediately. On the bottom right there is our cat rat, which is kind of what you use to get away from all the interference. Uh, the buttons on the bottom right switch between the different symbols. And if you see the color of the radius of the circles, uh, those are the signal that the tower is currently on. So you want to stay away from that in order to, in, in order to get away from the tower's interference. Uh, you can switch with them by either touching them or pressing the one to four number keys. Uh, the mini map kind of shows you where the towers are, where you are, and where the buildings are. Light blue is you, yellow is Lastly is on the top, there is kind of an interference meter, which kind of shows you how bad your signal is. And as you can see, if you're on red, if you're on red that apple there was actually a little distorted because you were kind of having interference while you're going through. You'll have often a lot of towers bunch up together. And for this one, so there's blue, brown, and green 
levels. So if you sound red, pancake, you'll get a more clear word out and be able to answer it more correctly. And yes, we would like to expand our special thanks to um, Sherry and Matt, who were the um, who provided the guidelines for us to create this game. And we would also like to extend our thanks to um, Dr. Cosman, Jay, and Soha for being wonderful mentors throughout our journey. And now we're going to open up the floor for any questions or comments that anybody from our audience has as well, as well as our YouTube live streaming audience. If there's anything at all. Okay. What, what age is it meant for? Hello. Uh, the age range is mostly for um, towards elementary and middle school um, middle school students so I'd say the range is from um, 6 to 13 years old I'd say but yeah it is once again catered towards a younger um, elementary to middle school audience I'd say so yes Uh, it depends on how long it takes for you to answer your, um, I mean, to answer the questions throughout each building. So it all depends on, once again, your timing and such. There, I mean, there's no time limit. It just, um, the only limit is just when, um, is just the distance that the cat goes through since it will only go through a particular, um, path. So, Yes. Uh, we were able to um, play test it a little bit. Um, we did go through a little bit of a crunch time, but um, in the last week, we were able to um, uh, test it out um, with some uh, other peers. Yes? So you said that your client originally wanted a World War II theme, but you guys switched it to this sort of spacey cat theme. How did that interaction come about? Like, how did giving feedback to your, your clients in a meeting, for example. Yeah, we uh, we did discuss it um, within our team before discussing with the clients first. So um, we did, uh, I mean, we did talk uh, talk it out. We mainly um, discussed why this would uh, be a more convincing, more um, interactive setting for the children to um, uh, play the game through. And then, um, yeah, the clients were overall, um, uh, they overall, they did like, um, our take on this game so that's how um yeah it was overall productive discussion when we um decided on the overall game setting yes for our software engineers uh anything that was particularly difficult to implement or anything that you wish you could have added but time didn't permit <laughs> so for me specifically I go way too high with projects, and sadly, I had to cut myself short in order to actually make this possible within eight weeks. I really honestly wanted to add a little endless mode where you could just constantly, where you could constantly just go through level after level after level of kind of increasing difficulty until you eventually failed and would have to start again. However, eight weeks wasn't enough time for us to develop that, so that ended up getting cut pretty fast. Another one that we really wanted to implement was a little boss, I mean, was a sort of a boss. So instead of just those towers, there would be um, like an enemy that would, um, I mean, would intensify the inter interference further and try to mess with your goals. Um, while we were not able to implement that boss in game, there will, the cutscenes do have some Easter eggs. So look forward to that. All right. Yes? Unless there are. Oh, we have one more. Let's have oh, go ahead. Get on that. Um, just kind of question. Mm -hmm. You have a little experience in the video game realm. I know you guys said you had early eight weeks. You know any difficulties? And I know when you decided to speak, you guys haven't seen Last of Us Standing. So I'm curious about the story you've done in that short period of time in the video game world. Because it's not an easy story to make it work. So I'm just curious when you came to start. Uh, when you came to that. Uh, what, what was that? 
thank you so much. We understand that the video game industry can be very hectic at times, so it's really appreciated. Yes? Yeah. There are a few questions from remote participants. And the first one, what was the most difficult part of the design process? Uh, I'll leave it to you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think uh, the most difficult part of the design process was just kind of like settling down on what to choose because like I said everything was changing daily like by the minute um, depending on what uh, the artist was doing you know uh, like uh, Gersh had mentioned and Jira we're just always like quality assuring like checking in with each other so I think that was the most challenging part is kind of like, is this what we're going with? And then maybe like the next day it was like, no, we got to change it. So, yeah. Yeah, there's one more question. Mm -hmm. um, were there times when the team didn't agree and how did you work that out? Oh, that's pretty yeah, we. There were some, I mean, while yes, we did go through some uh, significant changes throughout our project, I mean, most of us were pretty cooperative um, with it. We just, um, communication is extremely important with team-based projects like this, and all of us understood that pretty uh, pretty well. So, like, any conflict that we might have dealt with, like, we made sure that, like, we voiced any issues and, like, talked it out. So there hasn't been anything that um, we know might have caused some significant conflict, but we just worked it out together. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, should I change it to? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> Hello everyone, my name's Trent Simmons and I was the coach for Team 2. I am currently a PhD student at Northeastern studying human movement and rehabilitation science. My research primarily focuses on the study of neurological characteristics in autism using video games, so I was very happy to provide expertise into game design as well as technical advice to a, um, a number of the teams. Um, this team overcame a massive amount of adversity over these eight weeks, including staffing changes, as well as a variety, <laughs> several of us getting COVID. So I'm very proud of the work all of them have done, and um, I really hope you enjoy Star Swap. And without further ado, uh, we are Team Stellar Evolution, and we are very excited to share the game Star Swap with you today. Hi, my name's M. Finley. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I am a senior at UCSD studying speculative design, and after I graduate, I hope to go into adaptive game design. Hello, I'm Clary Dalgo. I'm the artist for Team <laughs> Stellar Evolution, and I gr recently graduated from Woodbury University in Burbank with a BFA in animation this spring, as well as previously having gone to uh, Landmark College in Vermont, which uh, specializes in people with learning differences. Hi, I'm Jackson Singley, and I was one of the programmers and developers for this game. I'm going to be attending the University of Delaware in the fall of 2023. Hi, I'm Alex Gomez, and I am a programmer, and I'm studying computer science at San Diego State. And I'm Daniel Smalley. I'm the project manager for our team. I'm from Carlsbad, California, and I'm a recent graduate of UCSD. I'm still me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is Star Swap? Star Swap is an educational game based on stellar evolution using a single player match three uh, gameplay in a multi-level setting 
to take the player through the process of a star's life cycle and stellar evolution. We start at the birth creation of a star, and through our missions or levels, we take the player from birth to death and what comes after in a star. And we did that by sort of emulating the nuclear reactions that happen inside of the stars. And we matched the chemicals that would be found in those reactions to the tiles that you match within the game. So as the player, you are actually in control of the elemental processes that take the star from birth to the rest of its cycle. So for those who might not be familiar, Match 3 games are a kind of genre or style of game that presents players with a grid of varying tiles. Uh, and then the gameplay revolves around trying to make matches of three or more identical tiles in a row or column with a single switch. Famous examples, of course, include Candy Crush, which perhaps you remember that one year where everyone had that on their phone. Uh, of course, Bejeweled and Puzzle Quest are additional examples. And for our topic, we decided that it was easiest to split the process into three distinct levels. And each of these levels, for their tiles, use elements that would be present during those stages. Later stages end up having heavier elements that are formed by more successive nuclear fusion. As the designer of this game, one of my main tasks was creating the game objective star cards. So at the end of each level, depending on how high or how low the player scored, there were two possible outcomes for each level. And the star cards are meant not only to create the excitement and replayability, because the, you know, the player's got to catch them all, but also to present a bulk information about each star and the stages that it goes through in connection to the level. So it's like the level is creating these stars through the reactions. I also wanted to take the player on a sort of narrative journey through this evolutionary process, which was a challenge to try and use these dry science facts and make sure that it was not only accurate, but presented in a way that was friendly and approachable and easily digestible. So we approached that by creating a narrative of the main character astronaut that the player will take the role of, and this sort of mystery space character who comes along and assigns these missions to the astronaut. And through their interactions between the three missions, we are taught not only about the information of each level, but how it progresses forward and how these would be seen in a real life sort of situation were we to really be involved in examining stellar evolution. This is what the cutscenes ended up looking like from storyboard on the previous slide to actually implemented in the game using Unity. And I was super excited to get to learn how to code these uh, cutscenes in between the levels because I had never coded anything in my life and I am extremely proud of how it turned out. Okay, as the, uh, as the artist for the group, I made a lot of assets including the story, UI, and the gameplay tiles. Here's a nice example of some of the more complex assets that I made for the cutscenes and the star cards that uh, cause that required a lot more uh, time to illustrate. And here's the variety of the tile gameplay tiles that you would see in the gameplay that I made. Uh, there's the base tiles that are the yellow, red, green, blue, as well as the special tiles for the various levels. And here's an example of the UI assets. There's a nice screenshot from the game, as well as next to it, the individual assets that would be layered on top of that, as you can see in the screenshot, that they're all individual pieces of art within the game. So at, in my programming duties, I was responsible for most, if not all, the game functionality and logic, and that involved a whole bunch of implementation of the ideas from the from the art and design team, along with just a just a bunch of the bug testing. Honestly, just fixing 
or just recreating everything that happened along the way. Um, but I'd say one of my biggest tasks was actually just plain and simple, a whole matching part. Like having to account for every possible situation, every possible match, and including the parts where I, co I, I couldn't check for those matches without causing some sort of error because dots didn't actually exist there, which would cause the entire game to collapse. So I had to create separate logic for each of these different rows on each of these different s sides of the map in order to keep the game running smoothly and to keep it from crashing in general. And I'm very proud of that whole functionality because it took me a very long time to work out. But yeah, thank you. So while Jackson was mainly focused on the gameplay, I was tasked with uh, menu integration and UI, and I worked on creating the user interface and player experience, and I've also uh, worked with on-click abilities of buttons. So as you can see here, we got a, um, the start menu, and so when you press the start button, it takes you to the gameplay, and so on the top right corner, there's a pause button, and when you um, press that, it triggers the uh, pause menu, and we got um, the options of resume, so resumes back to the game, I have also um, worked with a uh, Unity tag. So a tag is a reference to an object so that you can assign to a specific op op object that you want a reference to. And so I've coded a tag for the special helium, which allows Unity to recognize the object in the game for a specific functionality. And I've also the coded the uh, dust clump that um, so it would not match itself and so <coughs> it would create a blocker for the game. And then, of course, my role is project management. So a large part of that is basically who does what when and what do they need done first. I was very uh, thankful to have JIRA to assist me. It's a great program for planning tasks. And basically the way that works is you create individual task tickets. And for those, you're going to want to pick the right scope and exit criteria so that everything can get done at the right time, it's not having any crazy prerequisites. And you can complete it before the end of the current sprint, which is a set of work that is meant to be completed in a week. To uh, manage all of this, we also held daily stand-up meetings, as well as weekly open and close meetings. And basically, the main function of both is basically which tasks are done, which ones can be completed easily, which are being blocked by something. And if something's being blocked, then how can we resolve that block and get everything done? We also, of course, met with our client to ensure that we were staying within the standards that he had in mind for the game. Another part of my role was playtesting the game. There's lots of things you can do with playtesting, as well as determine what's a reasonable winning score are things working as expected, of course, is the big one, and are the art assets integrated in the correct positions? You can see in this example, in an earlier build of the game, the progress bar for how far you are towards the win condition of the level was not actually working, but because we play tested, we were able to catch that bug, and in later versions of the game, we were able to implement the progress bar. So for the sound design on this project, uh, this was the one I was probably uh, most involved in the sound effects for. Uh, so a lot of that was scouring YouTube to find a lot of uh, the bleeps and the squeeps and whatnot. Uh, one of the proudest moments of my life, to be honest. <laughs> um, and then uh, I also was tasked with adding reverb to the vocal samples I was supplied with, which I also did in Soundtrap. And as far as the soundtrack goes, uh, I recorded it on uh, solo marimba and uh, then put it in into Soundtrap and added uh, some reverb and, and equalizer stuff to make it sound a little more uh, spacious, I should say, I guess. And then we actually have a quick demo of our game here. And you can see right away, 
We're making matches. Matches are happening on their own as a result of tiles dropping down from the match. You can make large matches, up to five. And sometimes you'll have to look around for a while to uh, find the match, but as long as there is a match that can be made, the game will continue to run. You can see as well the progress bar climbs when the point total increases. Both the actual specific point counter and the progress bar are working correctly. And one thing you'll notice is matches larger than three actually form new elements like from hydrogen, helium, and from helium, dust clumps. This is an example of the uh, story cutscenes. Uh, you can see you basically click through and get the dialogue in text form. And then when you're ready, you just move on to the next mission. And you can see we're dealing with different elements here. We're dealing with hydrogen ions rather than hydrogen molecules, as well as the new blocker tile being carbon. You may also notice that while the progress bar is still filling up, it's doing so much slower as there is a higher threshold to win this level. And you can see we've moved on to 500 points. And at 500 points, you unlock a power up at this level that allows you to clear an entire tile of blocks, which will allow you to continue playing longer to try and get over the threshold. And before we go, We would like to uh, acknowledge everyone who made this possible. We'd like to thank our producer and client, Dr. Aaron Drews, who supplied us with a fantastic website with an outline and the basis for this entire project. Um, our phenomenal coaches, Trent and Corley, have been an, an enormous help this entire way. Our Ubisoft mentors, Lena and Mark, were amazing. Our phenomenal voice actor, Crosby, thank you so much. And we'd also like to give an acknowledgement to one of our first programmers, Ryan Wright. Thank you so much for being here today. And so we'd like to open up the floor for any questions for our second team. I know there's a bit of a delay on the YouTube as well, so we'll give them some time to think. Uh, at this stage, it was recorded. We uh, just didn't quite have everything implemented. Thankfully, in the demo stage, if any of you are staying for that, all the audio is implemented. You'll be able to hear the amazing uh, voice lines and uh, sound design. So to repeat the question for our YouTube viewers, the question was they were not able to hear the audio for the video, and Daniel had just explained that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, Sarah. I just have a comment. Um, I want you and everybody here to notice how many times multiple people in your group said that they were proud of the work that they did. Um, and I've been part of this program since its inception five years ago. And that is one of the most important things to us is not just that you're proud of the work that you deliver to your clients, but that you are proud of the work that you've done yourselves, the things that you've learned and done all those things. You should be super proud. This is very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anything else from our audience or our YouTube viewers? Um, especially like the design of the reward cards and the game assets. How did you create the explosions for matches? That's a great question. Uh, I will pass that over to you. Uh, it's uh, how the uh, pop on the matches. Oh, it was a particle effect within Unity, so we were able to do some of our assets outside of the programming software, and then we also did certain effects within the software of Unity itself. So that one was done in the programming. All right. Any further questions? All right. Well, thank you all.
an honor to present the Sun Valley. And last but not least, we have our final presentation of the day, Labyrinth of Oshkin Talk. Um, this project was done in collaboration with their client, Dominique Rosolo, who is somewhere in the crowd. I just can't see right now. I'm blind. <laughs> Hello. Yes. And as well as the guidance from their Ubisoft mentor, David Manuel. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let Ryan take it away. All right. Thank you for coming. Today we'll be presenting our game based on the Labyrinth, uh, labyrinth at Oshkin Talk, Sat and Sat, uh, uh, and the journey we took to get there there. So first, let's introduce the, use the team. My name is Ryan Sfiligoy. I am the project manager, and I am a, a mathematics major, major at UCSB. I'm Michael Billingsley. I'm the artist for this team. I gra recently graduated from San Diego State University in the Bachelor of Arts. Hello. My name is Logan Asher-Wayman. I am the designer for this team. I have not been to college, but I am here for work experience. Hello, I'm Kenta, and I'm the programmer for this team. I'm a current third year um, Mount, Santa, Mount, Mount San Antonio College student, and I, trans I plan to transfer to a four-year university, and I'm majoring in computer science. Good morning, my name is Juan. I am from Venezuela. I, am computer, I have a computer bachelor degree in the Central University of Venezuela. I came doing this internship and for work experience. All right, so we're going to take you through the process of this game. Aim. Um, our client Dominique Eek, Eek, wanted to, wanted to make a game that allowed uh, that allowed the player to explore or the or the labyrinth, labyrinth, and to teach more about Mayan culture and and its civilization. Nation. We were given, given a lot of freedom Edom, Edom, in how exactly we were go to go about it, and we were also given this 3D model, model of, the, of, of, the, of the labyrinth itself elf, to build our game within. And actually, he, um, he, he, went, uh, he went and to the, to the labyrinth himself elf, and used a laser scanner in order to create a photogrammetry point cloud model. model Model, which which he used to create that model that you've just shown you shown you for us. Uh, so oh, given all that, uh, we decided to make a, an escape room type game in which the player ear is trapped within the labyrinth, labyrinth, and and must uh, solve puzzles and find clues in order to in order to unlock the exit. Exit. As as the project manager manager, I. <laughs> I had to had to take I had to create tickets and 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 manage manage discussions sessions and I also worked on on the roadmap. App. This this roadmap app is a is a tool on Jira that allows allows the allows the project manager to set up a rough outline of what needs to be done in, in the project over the entirety of the project, creating start and end points endpoints for certain sections of the project and I color coded them and depending on what type of work. For example, blue in this case would be programming. Uh, as the artist on the TA, I had a lot of fun I had a lot of fun uh, researching uh, my paint uh, my architecture and artwork to in order to incorporate it to the game. Excellent. So the, I using Blender I created this uh, 3D torch that you'll be using to navigate the uh, labyrinth because uh, it's pitch black in there. It's like, and this would be the calendar that you'll be using to help you solve some puzzle. And there's a, and this will be the wall painting that you was used to uh, that we use to see the that you'll be using to see the puzzles on. And this will be the door that you that would be the door that would block your pathway. So for this project, I wanted it to be uh, inspired by Mayan music somehow, and I figured that the best way to do that would be to use actual Mayan music rather than uh, just sort of imitate it like a white boy. 
Um, so I, uh, I found some on YouTube that uh, I thought worked really well um, with the aesthetic we were going for. It had lots of uh, woodwinds and stuff, and um, that's pretty much it for this project. So as a designer, my job was to make the player feel like they're trapped in a labyrinth. So I was working with some post-processing right here. I designed the uh, ideal route for the game that the player would go through. I also made some of the collision for the, for the puzzles, and as well as designing some of the puzzles in question. And I was also responsible for trying to make the puzzles as unique as possible to freshen the experience. As you can see on the bottom left, or bottom right, you, you can see a screenshot using the post-processing that I have developed for the game. Out of all the puzzles, I'd have to say this one stands out for me because it's designed to be both fun and educational, like we did with all our other, all the other puzzles we made for the game. But it also holds up a decision that we wanted to use the Mayan calendar at some point in the game. These pages, as you see right here, are hidden across the whole level and will hide the, the solutions in plain sight. And they also reward the player for exploring the map and showing it off. As you can see, it's designed to look like either archaeological notes or a textbook to, that tells you about Mayan history. All right. So as a programmer for this game, um, I was in charge of implementing mechanics from design elements or art elements that were like made by a designer and artist. And um, these are some of the things I did, um, you can see above, but to give, give a general gist of it, um, I was in charge of um, doing player control, um, interaction, some UI um, events, like that kind of thing, um, like puzzles, all that stuff. And I was also in charge of making um, the GitHub, which is basically like version control, um, managing all the team's changes, all that kind of thing. And one gameplay element that I would like to highlight is the object interaction. And uh, to give a general description of object interaction, you look at some object, you interact with it, and something happens. Um, and in this case, you have to press a button, like the left mouse click, and, to, uh, and look at the object, and then it will do something. So this demonstrates like the page pickup part. But um, basically, um, this also allowed me to show off my Unity skills uh, within the game engine, and that was kind of the main focus of this Next slide. Um, and then the second gameplay mechanic I would like to highlight is the first puzzle, which is the number puzzle. Um, and this is actually the first puzzle that I implemented um, into the game. And then it has gone through a little bit of revision, but there it is. Um, and mechanic-wise, I put in number entry, submission, um, complete, incomplete, um, like full puzzle completion, skipping parts, all that kind of thing. Um, but also, I'm like pretty proud of it because this was actually the first gameplay feature that involved a lot of coding um, in order to implement like the logic and everything. And yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. And it also carried over a lot of other puzzles, yes. All right. From me, I did, uh, I implement the UI, the, the UI event. When you click a button, I did the menu. When you click a button, that takes you to another, do something go to, for example, the settings, or play the game, or continue, or see the credit. The another thing that I did is manage the, do the sounds management. If you do a volume, or you want sound. And the another thing, I put sounds to all events, for example, in that part, when you click the, when you pick up the, the page, I did, and I agree with Logan. I, I think that that was one of my favorite parts. Do the because I did the the, the spying wheel, and I put the sounds to that. So if you want, I did. For example, look the that ugly part in the left. That was the venue. Look how it turns, and look at this. The idea was uh, that when you click up or down, you go clockwise or or opposite the clockwise, and look now. And I clean the code for efficient reasons, things that you don't need, I clean it. 
and well, that's it. So, on to the gameplay demo. Um, uh, when you start the game, you start off in the start screen, and you have a few options. You can quit immediately if you want to. Uh, please, um, it tell, the game also tells you. So okay, so we can also adjust the volume, make the sound a little bit quieter, maybe a little bit louder, uh, depending on your preference. Um, and then, let's see. so then by at the start, it shows the intro cutscene. Uh, I'll skip it for demonstration purposes, but I recommend that you watch it. All right, moving on. Um, and then, when you first start the game, you want to first collect the page so that you can advance. Um, into the level. And this gives you the clue for the first puzzle. Um, and then when you start advancing, you will see immediately the first puzzle. Now, um, here you want to see open the notebook to have some clues. This tells you a little bit about how the Maya numbers are structured. Um, and then this is a like very simple arithmetic puzzle. And this is basically 8 in Mayan and then 9 in Mayan and that becomes 7. And this of course it plays a little bit of sound when you get the wrong answer, so don't do that. Alright, moving on. And then, uh, as you explore the labyrinth, you'll see a lot of puzzles, you'll see a lot of pages, and this incentivizes a lot of exploration to look for clues, maybe new puzzles, and um, if you see that door there, that opens up once you complete with all the puzzles. Um, now, so you could like kind of look around for that kind of thing, and you could see if you spot some of the pages or some of the puzzles um, as I explore this place. So, moving on. Um, this is the trivia puzzle. Um, notice that we don't have the correct clue page for this puzzle. It'll let you know, so don't worry about that. Now, we'll collect the puzzle or the page corresponding to that puzzle. And you can see that it gives you a little bit of a notification if you, um, you collect a puzzle page. Now, you can also open the notebook to see, like in the middle of the puzzle, to see your clues. I'll go through this a little bit fast. I, of course, recommend you read a little bit more. You could, of course, answer questions and everything. Yeah. That's kind of the structure of the game. And see the ending for yourself. OK. And then I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone everyone who made this, made this possible. First, I'd like to thank Dominic Rizzolo from the Cultural Heritage Engineering Initiative, National Geographic, and Mexico's National Institute of Anthropology and History, History, as well as David Manuel from Ubisoft uh, for, ment for mentoring us and guiding us through this process. Thank you. Any questions? It was a collabor collaborative effort, effort, but I'd say most of the credit goes to Michael himself Elf, on his work. So the question was, there was a lot of research that went into the project, mm -hmm. and um, it was asked if there was like a particular person who was in charge of it, and Ryan mm -hmm. mentioned that it was Michael who did a lot of the research. I think Logan also did a lot of research as well as mm -hmm. for like the background of the puzzles and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. And like the, I guess like the systems that were used in, oh wait, I guess I can use it. Um, a lot of systems that were used in like Mayan culture or like that we wanted to teach, we of course had to research that, you know, for example, the calendar system, the num like numerical system, and how we could like kind of make it fun to um, teach it to a audience um, of people who would like to learn more about Mayan culture. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. Yes. So the question was, will there be a way to play these games on our own? And right after this presentation, right next door, we've also rented out Atkinson Theater as well. So we welcome all guests to try out the games for themselves. Um, yes, I think there was a question here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go ahead. So are these games uh, published on our web and so that other people can have access? Um, so the question was, is this game published for other people to have access to. And I don't know if we have the precise answer for well, that. Not, not yet, but it might be. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Dominic? Hello. No, I'm 
somewhat biased. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Well, congratulations to all three teams and to Trent and Corley and to Pam and to our Ubisoft coaches. But um, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, as we all know, who we are very much shapes the questions we ask about the world around us. And this is a learning experience also for the scientists, for the researchers involved. There are new perspectives, new ideas, um, ways of looking at the places we study and the things that we do that surprise us and come from these kinds of collaborations. So this very much informs the research. It's not just something that happens downstream. It's something that really has us reorient and think about how we move through our own research spaces. And so I want to, in some ways, you know, on behalf of the researchers who are involved, um, thank you for the collaboration, the opportunity to collaborate in making that contribution. I'm glad we could help with a new perspective. <laughs> oh, Mm -hmm. Okay, to um, repeat the question, um, somebody asked, how do you handle the copyright issues, especially with when you're borrowing music and art for this game? So oh, on the topic of the art, art specifically, um, all the art we, we used, used was made, made by Michael himself. And on the subject of, of the music, music, we only used a six second clip and we and we and we modified it heavily, heavily, heavily. Um, that is what we're hoping is enough at the moment. Yeah, the millions. And another thing too is that there are sites that are free sounds that you can use for everything that you need. Thank free you. sound assets. It's uh, cool. Go ahead. So the topic. question was, since some of you are pretty close to graduating, um, how much further along do you feel like this internship has gotten you in terms of getting a job and like general work experience? Go ahead, Kenta. All right. So in terms of this internship, this is actually my first um, experience using Unity and also my first experience in like a um, formal work setting. So. A lot of things I learned um, in terms of soft skills was very valuable. For example, um, hitting deadlines, like planning in advance for those kinds of deadlines, right? Um, I also just learned a lot more about like coding, making code readable, which is not always something you kind of learn when you're uh, working by yourself, for example, and communicating changes, all that kind of thing. Um, and I think that was like really valuable that um, taught me a lot about like working in an actual like work environment. Yeah, that was something I learned. I would say a little. <laughs> Are there any questions? I would say a lot. <laughs> but, it, but it also helped me uh, learn how to collaborate with the team, uh, improve my art skills, such as improving my coloring skills, uh, learning how to make 3D models, all that stuff. Well, from my part, uh, the same the same thing that Kenta was. It was my first time working with Unity. I used to work doing websites. I didn't. Uh, yes, I did some games, but I didn't expect expect doing video games with uh, with a team that we have, a designer, an artist, and other things. And using the tools for working team like GitHub that. That help a lot. Even if you commit a mistake, you can go back and and fix the problem. And well, that's it. If to me, it's a wonderful experience. I would like to to keep working, doing video games all my life if I can. <laughs> As for me, I did some Unity before, so this was a good opportunity to shake off some of that rust, okay. shall we say. And it's also been a good good learning experience in working in a work working in a team like this i have done so before with uh in an academy that's not really college it's called non 
and uh, it's a game. I mean, it's a game academy for people on the spectrum like me, and other neurodiverse people. And overall, I'd say I feel a lot more confident having worked in this sort of situation now. Okay. I'm not very close to graduating personally, but I feel that this was a good, good step step in my in getting wor some work experience and getting to better understand an industry industry I have interest in. Uh, there's one question from remote participants. Um, was there a feature you plan to implement but changed or didn't? Oh my, a lot of them. <laughs> um, um, our, our project, project specifically, it has gone through a lot of changes, changes due to varying, varying things. Um, we got some conflicting information about the calendar originally, originally in our research. Um, we, we'd originally thought that the, that the calendar accounted for leap year, leap year. Year, we found out it did not, and that, and because of that, uh, as of that, we uh, um, the calendar was not one to one with with the modern day calendar, calendar. So we could not use the time of year as an as an example. We had we originally had an idea, yeah, you know, with shifting the light with shifting the light depending on the time of year, year year, and and that and that idea. Yeah, um, had to be had to be reworked because we couldn't, couldn't um, couldn't one un unmake the make the light rays work properly, and two, the the year would not be would not necessarily be accurate forever. The time of year would not be accurate forever. It also had more than one level. So we were initially going to have like separate levels uh, where like if you get past all the puzzles in the first one, you go. I think we we're starting on like the second level in this one. Um. Yes. Yes. We we originally had had a night had it planned out all this whole thing with 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 the two levels inside and then maybe a level on the outside, right? But we were limited by the amount of time we had. And we have but we have some designs for or the lower levels, but uh, it never. But it never became much. Um, I would also like to speak a little bit on the um, "quote unquote" future ch future changes, as in, if we had enough time, we would like to implement that kind of thing. Um, so one would be probably like a mini map, so that like you kind of know where you're traversing, and that's important for one of the puzzles. Um, you know, it could help with that a lot. Um, another thing, possibly like you know, as mentioned, the light thing. If we do, like, if we had enough time, we could probably, like, or we would have probably implemented some kind of cool puzzle um, with, you know, the light system uh, within Labyrinth. But, of course, um, this was actually a good learning experience as well, where um, we kind of have to, like, prioritize certain, like, certain features that we deem, like, really important, uh, and then, like, kind of fitting it into the time, like, the time space, I guess. Um, and, yeah, I think that was a pretty good experience to, like, kind of, do a lot of scheduling, for example, or like kind of planning which priority like a uh, certain feature would have. Our concept of the MVP evolved over the course of this project. Amazing work, you all. I am now going to let Dr. Cosman end us with some closing comments. So please go ahead. Well, that was absolutely amazing what all of you did. Com completely remarkable, and you've blown us all away. There's a lot that went on behind the scenes, so, a number of people I really want to thank. So the coaches, Corley and Trent, um, you did an amazing job. And Corley also was our program administrator, so she did everything from the, the interviews to handling payroll and, and everything else. I can't thank you guys enough. Our clients, uh, Aaron, Dominique, uh, Sherry, and Matt, thank you. Um, your, your role was expected to be just 
you know, specifying the initial game concept, but you all went above and beyond um, and were real mentors for the teams throughout. So thank you. And of course, our Ubisoft um, mentors who provided advice along, along the way on so many things, career advice, technical advice, all kinds of other things, and showing them what it might be like to work in the game industry. And then there's other people, uh, program evaluators, uh, Monica and uh, Georgia from the Center for Research and Evaluation, um, who do all of the evaluation work um, for the internship. The, uh, I want to thank Alexandra Alhedef um, from the Fabulous Company for the habit forming app. And thank you. Uh, they've given uh, free lifetime access to the app to our interns. Our graduate students, um, Owner, Saigon, um, and Jada, who are doing the research underlying this. I want to thank the, uh, st the staff of the Qualcomm Institute and Ramesh Rao um, for giving us uh, space over the summer for the internship and for all of the logistical help with everything from the lunch and learn events uh, to today's event. So thank you. And then there are a number of faculty on the project. Besides myself, there's Sujit Day, um, Craig Callender, and Shauna Cohen. Uh, we have our sister program at Northeastern University, and that's run by Professor Leanne Chukoski, and she has her entire team. of So they've got the interns there, coaches, clients, the Ubisoft mentors, so everything that you saw uh, here today. Uh, same thing happening uh, there. They had their showcase earlier today. And, and lastly, uh, there's the funding, without which we wouldn't be able to do this. So we have funding from the California Workforce Development Initiative um, and from the National Science Foundation. The, uh, for next summer, we will be running this internship again, both at UC San Diego, um, and it'll be happening at Northeastern University, so please spread the word. We'd love to get a lot of uh, applications from, from people all over. Um, there are, uh, Northeastern at least, is, is uh, for this summer, they ran a remote team as well as in-person team, so I'm not sure exactly how things will go for next summer. Anything can happen, but we do expect that uh, the program will be running again at both sites. So thank you very much to everyone, and amazing job, interns. And at this point, um, please join us outside. There's going to be lunch uh, set up there. Um, you can eat, and also next door, right next door, all of the interns um, are going to be showing off their projects so you can sit down and actually play the games. Thank you.